The story begins at night, while it was pouring down with rain. We see a group of people gathered at a funeral, and here at the wake is a boy full of rage and anger as a girl hugs him while looking at the tombstone and remembers what had happened. We see inside the boy's mind how a man named Howard is about to die, but when the boy approaches to try and help him, he calls out to the boy by name, Ray White, and who is also our main protagonist. Howard warns Ray and tells him that he must survive this no matter what. But right after he said it, Howard is then destroyed and right after, Ray quickly turns his head to the side and sees a woman laying on the ground, who seems to also be dead. Then Ray furiously screams and unleashes a great power that makes his eyes and hair freeze up, and also causes a giant ice dome around them. While the ice dome forms around the area, another person is seen far away in the distance observing the boy using his powers and witnessing Ray using his skills in a way they never could imagine. After the dome heats up and begins to fade away, and Ray is seen holding the woman in his arms, but this was all a memory from the future and before all this happens we see a young Ray White, beginning his first day of high school, and we have a change of scenes. Ray is arriving for the first time at the new school called the Academy of Sorcerers. While he walks in, he stops for a moment to look on the school map and tries to locate the auditorium, since he got lost and still doesn't know where he is. While he stops to look at the map a green-haired girl bumps into him and nearly falls over, but before she does, Ray manages to take her hand just in time. In addition to this, he apologizes, making the girl blush but she tells him not to worry. After Ray explains to the green-haired girl that he's only a new student and it's his first day here, so he doesn't know the place very well. Right after, two other girls behind them mention that the new students have already visited the school two days ago, and they've all left already after their tour of the building. But the other girl tells them that she's just heard that there was also going to be another new student today. But his reason for arriving late was because this student wasn't a real sorcerer or an aristocrat, and he was simply just an ordinary student, and they are talking about Ray. After hearing these words, the green-haired girl is surprised by this, and is also very upset with Ray, and said that she didn't expect someone with his heritage to even be anywhere near her, especially touching her, and tells him to let go. The others all look at him with disgrace and stare at him in disbelief, as this was the first time a normal boy with no magic background was allowed into the school. After, a group of boys approach him, and out of the group there is a big mouth proud noble kid called Albert. However, despite his rude attitude, Ray still tries to be friendly to his peers and tries shaking his hand, but Albert throws his hand away, telling him that this is a school only for the nobles, or at least being a descendant from a noble sorcerer's family, and how Ray doesn't belong here. Albert is confused, and asks Ray how he managed to study here, and demands him to tell him which strings he pulled in order to enter such place of nobility. Ray responds, saying his only wish was to learn something from this academy and not to bother anyone. But this response bothers Albert a lot, so he tries to fight him, but before he delivers another blow, he is interrupted by a sweet-hearted girl who seems to be known by all the students of the school and is apparently a powerful first-class mage named Amelia Rose. She tells Ray and Albert to stop at once and Rose introduces herself to Ray. She is a daughter to one of the most powerful sorcerer families in the world. The ceremony begins and welcome all the new students at the academy and the host of the event does a presentation and she tells everyone that Arnold's Academy is the most prestigious academy in the world and only has the most talented sorcerers. But just because they all come from noble families or prestigious sorcerer backgrounds, this does not mean that they can just be lazy and not work as hard, as all mages that study here will still have to train incredibly hard to be able to achieve first-class sorcery. And to stand out from the rest of the class you will need to learn important skills and test your abilities as a sorcerer. At the end of her speech she introduces herself as the principal named Abby Garnet, and after the announcer gives the name of who will be the school's student representative, which turns out to be Amelia Rose. After the ceremony they all enter the classroom, but they realize that everyone is speaking poorly about Ray. Meanwhile the teacher tells him to introduce himself and he tells them all that he is the new boy who comes from an ordinary family, and he's well aware that he happens to be the only person in the school's history since its foundership who doesn't possess any sorcery at all. But although this is true, he's still truly honored to be accepted into the school, and he promises to the teacher and the rest of the class that he will work just as hard as they do and not to let any of them down. After his introduction, she tells him to take a seat. When walking to his seat Amelia Rose thanks Ray for such a good introduction and this makes Albert angry, but when Ray sits in his seat, he looks outside the window and the school bells begin to ring. While the bells ring he looks towards the outskirts of the school and we see the rest of the city. But while he keeps looking outside, Ray begins to have a horrible visions of the city burning as it suddenly starts to catch fire. He tries to see what the cause of the fire was by going deeper into the vision. But just then the teacher is repeatedly calling out his name, making Ray come back to reality. 
The teacher throws a piece of chalk at him to get his attention and he manages to catch it. But then the chalk explodes and she tells him to start concentrating. She continues on with the topic of the class which is about the ranks of the sorcerers. Then the teacher asks Amelia Rose if she knows all the ranks of magicians. Amelia tells her that the sorcery society is made up of five ranks. There is bronze, being the lowest, silver, gold, platinum, and then finally the highest of ranks is called the grand rank otherwise known as the sacred rank. The teacher tells them all how the sacred rank only holds seven wizards at a time and are the best in the world. These are beings who possess legendary sorcery skills and can do unexplainable things that they do not teach in the academy. She goes on to say that these seven sorcerers are everything that they should strive to become but it's unlikely any student will ever get to become one of the seven. The seven grand level sorcerers are known to be from the most infamous families, known throughout history, but even so, the seven magicians are still full of mysteries as they only know some small details about each one of them which interests Ray and the rest of the class. The teacher tells them that although most of the information about these sorcerers is not available to the public, there is still some things they do know and can teach the class. So the teacher tells them the first secret which is that their headmaster, Abby Garnet, is one of the seven, and she is the sorceress who dominates the fire class. She then tells them about another one of the seven, called Carol Caroline who is one of the best sorceress, and is mostly known for her excessive and deep research of the dawn of all sorcerers, and who happens to be the only one out of the seven who often appears in the public eye. After Carol, she also talks about a man, they call him a legendary hero from the war in the east, and Amelia Rose mentions to the teacher that she seems to be talking about the Ice Blade Sorcerer. The teacher agrees with Rose, and says that the Ice Blade Sorcerer has suddenly disappeared after the war, and as for the rest of the sorcerers, they still don't know anything about them yet. Not even their names. However, she tells everyone that if they have the right goals set in their mind, then they could train very hard and perhaps one of them will be a part of the seven one day. After this talk, Albert interrupts the teacher and tells her that if they want to teach all the students how to become one of the legendary seven sorcerers, then why would they bring an ordinary person like Ray to the class, which might slow everyone down and everyone begins to think the same thing. But this seems to bother the teacher so she demands silence from Albert and says that everyone in the room is able to study because they have passed the entry exam. So for this reason, even Ray is at the same point as everyone so far. She suggests Albert to be quiet and sit down. After this, the teacher asks Rose to define sorcery, and she answers that it is the art of reconstructing matter and prime which is the existing matter of the world. The teacher agrees with Rose's answer and explains to the others about Rose's answer in depth. She does a little demonstration of something called code theory, which is the core of how reconstructing matter begins, and says that first of all, all matter must be coded so they can then use it for magic. After you code and reconstruct the matter, each sorcerer can then add or remove more or less data as they wish, and after that they make the code come true. Then the teacher creates a little spell and after that destroys it. In addition to this, after creating any spell or magic they can delete it at any time they want. Rose raises her hand and asks the teacher if there is any limit on reconstructing matter, but the teacher answers, saying that there are no limits on their magical potential, and that their greatness all depends on the ability of each sorcerer's skills and mindset from within. After she explains each way magic can be formed in, and there are four categories in which matter can be divided into. There is solid, liquid, gases and finally plasma state, and other states that are products combined with all of them put together are known as phenomenon magic. After this, the teacher asks again if they have any other questions, and after, a rather quiet student standing at the back of the class asks the teacher if they will also be learning what's called the antimatter code, which ultimately destroys magical spells in an instance, and new spells they've created before can be erased, and it's also known as the Ainsworth twofold method. The teacher tells her no, and that no sorcerer uses the antimatter code anymore, and that it's something they do not need to learn and must be forgotten about. After she decides to continue with the class, and all the students start to practice their first spells and we see Rose who manages to perform a spell successfully in the matter of seconds. And on the other hand we see Ray who can't seem to form any spell correctly. Rose was watching him fail at the smallest of tasks and also many other nobles are watching him and Albert is still incredibly angry that he has to share a classroom with an ordinary and weak person. After the first class ended, we see Ray walking around the academy, and he notices someone enter through a door, so he decides to follow the person through the door. And there he reaches a library where he meets the mysterious girl that had entered the door, and he realized it was the girl who was asking the teacher about antimatter code theory, and the Ainsworth's twofold method. After she introduces herself to Ray as Alyssa Griffith, Alyssa tells Ray that the Ainsworth magic book is what she was looking for, since that has been her obsession and she is Dr. Ainsworth's biggest fan, and this is why she asked the teacher about the Ainsworth theory. She also mentions that she wants to be like Ainsworth since she is an incredible sorcerer, 
and researcher. After, Alyssa asks Ray if he also likes Ainsworth's research too, and he agrees with Alyssa and said that Ainsworth was also something he's obsessed about too, making Alyssa very excited. Alyssa tells him this is the first time anyone else has said they loved Ainsworth like her, and are also interested in the same things, such as the backwards antimatter theory. But right then Ray turns into the ultimate Riz God and randomly switches the subject to say how beautiful her hair is, and why she always wears a hoodie. She gets very nervous and tells him it's because she gets bullied for her ears, as she's half-elf, so she always covers them up with a hood. But Ray tells her that her ears are perfect and that he thinks elves are cute. Alyssa asks Ray why he's so mature, and that he doesn't seem to be the same age as the rest of the classmates. And then Alyssa tells Ray that he reminds her of the Ice Blade God from the tales within the historical books, which surprised Ray a lot. After this, Alyssa says her goodbyes for now and thanks Ray again for having shared some time with her, as she's always lonely, but now she's just made a new friend. After, Ray visits his dorms for the first time, and he arrives at the room in which he will be sleeping in, and there he meets a guy called Evie Armstrong, who is waiting for Ray's arrival. He tells Ray that he was waiting for him, only to tell him that he was not the same as those rich nobles and he doesn't care if he is a commoner. After, Evie approaches Ray and out of nowhere they do a muscular handshake and compliment each other on how strong they are. They both act in a way that seems like they already knew each other. They both bump their fists and welcome each other to the academy. The next day Ray is exercising, and he quickly passes by a girl, so fast that she almost dropped her flower pot. But the protagonist turns back and apologizes to her and she tells him not to worry about it, and that she's surprised that he's up this early to exercise. She then asks if he is a new student, and Ray tells her he is new and introduces himself as Ray White. The girl tells him that she has already heard of him, since everyone talks about him and he is already famous for being the first common boy to attend this school since the history of the academy. After, the very excited girl introduces herself as Rebecca Bradley, and that she is in the upper third grade. In a change of scene, we see Ray walking with Evie, and he tells Ray that Rebecca Bradley belongs to one of the three most powerful families and that it is very strange how Ray doesn't know who the top three families are yet. So Evie tells him that these three families are the Rose family, the Bradley family and the Aldrin family, and tells him that these three families have always been the most powerful, besides the royal family. And these three families have just as much influence in politics and economic status as the royal family. Ray wonders about Amelia Rose, so Evie answers him, saying that she is the eldest daughter of the Rose family, which is the most noble family out of the three, and that she happens to be a kind-hearted individual, with good manners and incredible sorcerer abilities. After their talk, Ray tells Evie to go ahead and that he needs to be alone right now, as the headmaster, Abby Garnet has summoned him into the headmaster's office for a talk. Then Ray goes to see the teacher and while on his way there, a girl was running in quite a hurry, and ends up barging into him. The girl insists that Ray should apologize immediately, but Ray tells her that he doesn't have to apologize at all, since he was the one who was walking normally, and she was the one who was running through the corridors like a little brat. However, she tells him that she is the most popular girl in the school, born of ultimate cuteness, and that her family is known as the Clevelands, so he should be respectful. Ray stops her annoying whining like a giga chad, and is the bigger man in the situation, and just apologizes anyway. After she then seems interested in Ray's mature behavior and seems to then recognize who she is talking to, she calls him the common boy that everyone is talking about. Ray confirms that he is indeed the regular boy and just then he also rises up the girl who ends up giving him her name, Clarice Cleveland. He tells her he likes her pigtails, making her soap below. She is moved by this compliment and Ray continues to say how beautiful she is but then stops her by saying that he needs to be somewhere, and by the way she was running just a second ago, she needs to be somewhere too, and she runs away. Finally Ray arrives at the headmaster's office and he has received Abby. Surprisingly, Ray doesn't call her the head teacher, but refers to her as the colonel. But she tells him it's no longer necessary for him to call her that and said that the war is finally over, so he can just call her Abby like everyone else to make sure he blends in. After that, Abby begins to laugh and tells Ray that he hasn't changed one bit since the war, and then told him it's okay to leave. The presence of Ray brings back a lot of memories for Abby, and in a change of scene we see the school is having a training day, and they will spar each other in a fencing class. The first pick is a battle between Albert and Ray, but before starting, the teacher tells the opponents that this is only a mock battle, and if it happens to go any further than that, he will have to intervene. Ray is getting mocked by the rest of the class and is given the nickname the Withered Wizard. Saying this, the confrontation will begin and Albert begins to underestimate Ray for being a common boy, and just at that moment when the teacher tells them to start, he launches a great attack against Ray. He thought that Ray would be an easy target to duel with, but Ray with a single swift and delicate move, manages to end the entire confrontation in seconds, leaving everyone present completely surprised. 
Albert cannot take the humiliation and gets even more enraged and launches another attack again with the sword. But Ray perfectly calculates a counterattack that breaks Albert's sword into pieces. And the whole time the duel was being witnessed by Abby, and she starts talking under her breath, calling Ray White her old friend, and what an honor it is to have the Ice Blade Sorcerer at the Academy of Wizards, and is excited that he's pretending to be a weak ordinary guy among the other students. After working out together, Ray tells Evie that he wishes to join two clubs. While the latter seems unsure about his decision, Ray shows off a shining card. Later on, Ray barges into the room of the Environmental Research Club, where muscle-bound fitness enthusiasts welcome his sight. As the club's president gives him a lukewarm greeting, Evie announces their objective as both hunters and researchers. Luckily, they don't treat commoners less favorably than nobles, although the president believes Ray's physique does not fit their standard. That said, Ray confidently takes his clothes off, leaving their jaws dropped open. Realizing that he's a brawny young man, the president takes out a card which turns out to be a gold-class hunter license. When Ray shows his own card, the members find themselves in disbelief seeing a commoner on par with their president's level. Ultimately, they welcome Ray as the newest addition to the club. Not long after a small celebration, Ray goes straight to his next preferred club with its members that are quite the opposite of his first organization. Surprised to see Ray, Rebecca asks him if he really wants to be a member of the gardening club, to which he reveals that he's always loved plants. With Ray confirming that being in a harem, or more accurately, getting surrounded by girls, won't be a problem. Rebecca almost accepts his application on the spot, if not for Dina Sira, who protests against his membership. She claims that Ray is only after their president. After considering the matter, Rebecca leaves Ray under Dina's supervision to determine if he's a good fit for the club. To start the test, Dina orders him to revamp an unkempt rooftop lawn and make it suitable for gardening in a week. Without further ado, Ray gets down to business. On day three, Rebecca checks on him and brings some snack. While talking about her role in the academy, they get interrupted by two students training down below. Rebecca then mentions the upcoming Sorcery Swordsman tournament that will determine the strongest swordsman among the students. As Rebecca suggests Ray join the competition, she gets distracted by his muscles to the point that she can't help but touch them. Seeing her reaction, he flexes his biceps, turning her slowly into a simp. In less than a week, the gardening club members are too stunned to speak when they see the result of Ray's hard work. Against her wishes, Dina finally accepts his application. Sometime later, Ray meets Abby, who informs him about a spy hiding in the academy. Should he see anyone suspicious, the principal asks him to report to her office immediately. Heading to the dorm, he stumbles upon Claris Cleveland, who's busy looking for a bug. While Ray is baffled by her interest in bugs, she reveals that she likes them more than cats and dogs, which unfortunately leaves her with a few friends. As expected, our MC offers to become her friend, and she gladly accepts it. The next day in class, Ray gets asked to explain the branches of sorcery from the low, mid, high, and saint level. He nails the oral recitation, prompting Albert's annoyed face to flash on the screen. With the approaching Kafka Forest skill practical training, the class ends early. Before Helena leaves, she asks the students to form multiple groups with four members each. After that, they rush to persuade Amelia to join their party, but she already has her eyes set on Ray. Evie volunteers to team up with his gym buddy. Ray then approaches Alyssa, and with his unmatched Riz, she agrees to join their party. Completing the dream team, Amelia takes the last spot, shocking everyone. Afterward, the students are spotted in the woods, where Helena announces the main objective of the training, to reach the center of the forest. She declares that each team's collected stamps will affect the final result, and they will only have 24 hours to finish the challenge. With several monsters lurking in the shadows, Amelia comes up with their formation. The duo will be vanguards, while Amelia and Alyssa will take the center and the rear guard, respectively. Hearing this, Ray suggests Amelia swap positions with him, to which she agrees despite feeling skeptical about his claim that he's experienced with their current practical training. Soon enough, the activity begins. Everything's going as smoothly as planned until Alyssa comes across a giant wasp, scaring the living daylights out of her. As Evie and Amelia prepare to engage, Ray takes it upon himself to eliminate the monster. The reaction on their faces says it all. Just then, they find a stamp and mark their notebooks with it. At night, they set up camp, and the girls talk about Ray's impressive combat skills and wilderness survival knowledge. Evie chimes in and mentions his friend being a gold-class hunter. To keep it low-key, Ray states that he encountered more monsters in his hometown's forest which became his training ground. Safe to say that Amelia does not buy his cover story as she gives him a suspicious look. The following day, a blood-curdling scream stops them dead in their tracks. Ray rushes to check the situation, leaving his group behind. Once there, he sees Albert fending for himself as his members get restrained by the three-eyed monster's silk. In haste, Ray charges at his prey, eliminating it with ease. 
Still acting all high and mighty, Albert refuses to thank Ray and asserts that he had the situation under control. Shortly, the trio arrives at the scene. While Amelia can't believe Ray single-handedly defeated the monster, a mysterious hooded figure revives it. While his classmates' nerves are on edge, Ray is unfazed by the monster's evolved form. At the same time, Clarice hears the loud roar of the monster, causing her to stop walking and marvel at the rare sight. Ray attacks the monster, but his weapon fails to pierce its hardened exoskeleton. For this reason, activating his hidden power enters his mind, but just as his eyes start to glow, Amelia summons a firewall. Evie throws a rock while Alyssa manipulates the air, adding more force to the object's velocity until it hits the target. Upon seeing an opening, Ray deals the decisive blow, cutting the monster in half. While Albert helps his members break free from the silk, Clarice and her expressive twin tails struggle to maintain composure, smitten with Ray's exceptional strength. As soon as the cloaked figure disappears, they proceed with collecting the final stamp. During the awarding ceremony, Ray's party gets proclaimed as the winner. Clarice cheers for her friend's team, but her celebratory moment gets cut short when she notices everyone sneering at a commoner's achievement. Nonetheless, Evie tells Ray that their cold reaction won't change the fact that they won. A few days later, Ray visits Lydia Ainsworth. It is then revealed that she is actually his master. After exchanging pleasantries, the two sit down for some tea and talk about Ray's current condition. Lydia says that it will take at least five years until he fully recovers. Interestingly enough, Ray mentions the activation of a forbidden spell. Lydia tells him that she will leave it to his judgment should he get forced to use it someday as her successor as the Iceblade Sorcerer. Lydia then informs Ray about why she called for his presence, revealing that there's a rumor going around the researcher's circle. As the founder of the Double Code Theory, she stresses that her research is focused on the brain, responsible for sorcery's creation. Ingram, the physical basis which accounts for the persistence of memorizing sorcery, has drawn the attention of some outlaws. She claims that these obsessed eugenics have abandoned ethics for their selfish goals. Unwilling to wait and extract information from a sorcerer's brain, they cut it entirely to expedite the process. After discussing the eugenics atrocities, Lydia burns their offer letter into ashes. On a lighter note, Ray takes his master for a stroll along the woods. When she asks him if he has already made some friends, he mentions Evie and the girls. Switching the topic to the tournament, Lydia, the four-time champion of the said competition, encourages Ray to participate. He makes her aware that he only wants to be an onlooker and cheer for his friends. Before they part ways, she hands him a book which she guarantees will help him someday. One morning, Alyssa steps out of her dorm when Ray coincidentally runs past her. At that point, she sees him in slow motion. He stops by her and asks where she's off. When Alyssa tells Ray she's going to the library, he asks if he can join her. Ray quickly changes his clothes, and so does Alyssa. Seeing her new outfit, our MC's tongue starts dripping with flattery, making her feel shy. At the library, Alyssa picks Ainsworth's book about Ingram while Ray reads a romance novel. It seems like Ray really knows his priorities. Once outside, Clarice chanced upon them. After contemplating whether or not to approach Ray, he turns up before her eyes and invites her to lunch. Upon arriving at a local cafe, he formally introduces the two ladies to each other. Indeed, while there's an air of awkwardness between them, the chat is simply enjoying his role as the main character. In the end, the girls eventually warm up to each other. As such, they walk home together after thanking Ray for the lunch date. Just as they leave, Amelia comes into sight. He runs toward her and discovers that she just finished attending the nobles' gathering, which she hates a lot. Her gloomy expression immediately changes when Ray begins to shower her with compliments. However, her mood changes again when she learns Ray went on a three-way date with Alyssa and Clarice. And so, she demands Ray to accompany her next. Amelia takes him to a boutique where she tries on different outfits and asks his opinion about how she looks. This recap will take us hours if we cite all the compliments coming out of Ray's mouth. For the record, he's not even aware that his tongue is his mightiest weapon. Later that day, he goes to school upon the request of their instructor. Helena asks Ray about his academy life, to which he says he's satisfied with it so far. Clearly, Helena did not expect his response. Knowing full well that most of the students despise him, Helena apologizes for not standing up for him. To make up for her shortcomings, she assures Ray that he can always count on her. Elsewhere, Albert, who hasn't been showing up in school for days, is seen enhancing his flame magic. As he vows to defeat Ray, the cloaked figure shows up in the background, wearing an evil smirk. The following morning, Rebecca confirms to Ray if he's going to be a part of the committee members at the tournament. He says yes and shares that he plans to cheer for Amelia, who has become the competition's early favorite due to her bloodline. Speaking of which, Ray asks about the last family that completes the top three high-ranking nobles. Rebecca reveals that it's the Algren family, with their eldest daughter studying at Dom Academy of Sorcery. A while later, the teacher begins the training for the preliminary competition for the amateur group that will determine Arnold Academy's representative. As the expected 
elected representative, Amelia takes down her opponent in under a minute. Determined to push herself to the limits, she asks to fight Ray next. For the nth time, the entitled nobles stare daggers at him. After getting the teacher's permission, the two colleagues start the mock duel, and Amelia charges first. After a series of parrying her attacks, Ray notices that her strikes lack strength, but her speed makes up for it. She continues to be aggressive, but still, she can't land a hit on Ray. In the middle of the fight, he recalls his training days with Havard, which somehow distracts him, getting him carried away. Before Ray delivers the final blow, he manages to stop himself and drops his sword. With that, the teacher declares Amelia as the winner. At the cafeteria, Ray gets cornered by his companions, asking him where he learned swordsmanship. As a response, he confesses that he has a mentor who not only taught him to wield a sword but also introduced him to sorcery. Out of nowhere, Albert disrupts their peaceful meal and asks Ray for a duel. To finally stop his foolishness, he accepts his challenge. Outside the school's premises, the two lads square up to each other. From the looks of it, the battleground is enclosed with a massive barrier. After throwing a real sword to Ray, he declares a single rule, the first one to surrender loses. Albert launches aggressive charges enhanced by his sorcery, leading Ray to be on the defensive. Consumed by anger, Albert goes berserk as he continuously hurls fireballs at Ray. To his dismay, the latter cuts through his magic. Refusing to back down, Albert generates more fireballs, but it's a futile effort. He summons his blazing dragon, only for his flames to get snuffed out. Throwing himself prostrate on the ground, Albert lets out an anguished sob for his crushing defeat. Upon witnessing how the battle concluded, Amelia demands Ray to reveal his real identity. Just as he's about to confess everything, someone alters the gravity and pins them on the ground except Ray. The cloaked figure steps out, laughing maniacally. In a short while, it is revealed that Helena is actually the spy hiding in the academy. Claiming that she will sacrifice the students' lives for the development of sorcery, Ray puts off his revelation as he plans to deal with their teacher first. He eventually connects all the dots and realizes that Helena is a member of eugenics. As it turns out, she was responsible for controlling the monsters in the forest during their training, as she wanted to kidnap students to study their engrams. Even though Albert lacks the skills and is only overflowing with pride, Helena thanks him for buying her time to capture the promising sorcerers inside the barrier. Enraged, Ray swears to teach their teacher a lesson the hard way. Aware that he has the advantage in close quarter combat, Helena keeps her distance and summons double fire snakes. Seeing Ray evading her attacks, she controls her magic, threatening to set the students ablaze. Out of options, he activates his power to protect them, revealing his true nature as the Ice Blade Sorcerer. While Helena can't believe her eyes, Ray conjures up ice blades and dispels her power. She calls upon the Purgatory Dragon, but he easily nullifies it with anti-material code. Terrified, Helena tries to escape, but the blades stop her. She then pleads with him to spare her life, but it's all an act to execute a sneak attack. To her horror, her dirty little trick leaves Ray unscathed. As she admits the huge gap in their powers, Helena resolves to inject the product of eugenics research into her brain, hence transforming her into a bloodthirsty monster. To keep up with Ray's tremendous power and muster all her remaining strength, Helena removes the barrier and lifts the spell holding the students down. Even so, she still can't land a solid hit on her opponent. Every time Helena fires projectile attacks, Ray just keeps negating them. Despite the odds, Helena has no plan to surrender as she uses more sinister magic. While Ray still has the upper hand, it appears that he can't fully control his power as it starts to take a toll on his body. Seeing his terrible condition, Helena clings to a sliver of hope that she can still turn things around. That is until Ray uses the ice flower perfusion, sending her screaming in agony as she gets caught up in a blizzard. And just like that, Helena gets sealed away in a block of ice. After exhausting his power, Ray drops to his knees and loses consciousness. The story shifts to a brief flashback when Lydia found the young Ray in the combat zone. She took him to the military camp and asked the Major for permission to keep the child under her care for the time being. When she figured out that the kid was the sole survivor in his village, she decided to take him in. When he woke up, Lydia rushed to check on him and heard his name Ray for the first time. She and Carol had become fond of him as days passed, and they both protested against the idea of sending him to an orphanage. To their relief, the Major allowed Lydia to raise Ray for as long as it wouldn't affect her duty as a soldier. Since then, six years have passed, and the long-standing Far East War was about to reach its conclusion. With his great talent at a very young age, Ray was sent to the battlefield as he put the enemies into utter destruction. Back at the camp, the Major informed the Astral Unit that two grand sorcerers succumbed to their deaths in the war zone. As the battle intensified, Ray was given the chance to back out, and we already knew that he chose to stay with his newly found family. Touched by his decision, Havard promised Ray that he would protect him at all costs. 
This is the part where Havard's demise triggered Ray's overheat, a case prone to modern sorcerers, which causes them to lose control of their power and thus overuse their sorcery. This phenomenon could potentially lead to their deaths. Needless to say, Ray refused to kick the bucket. As soon as he wakes up, he is greeted by his master, who tells him that she would have done the same for her comrades. Abby walks in and commends him for capturing the culprit and saving the students. Just as Lydia leaves, her maid Carla Hale whispers to Ray that her boss cares about him a lot. Now alone with Principal, she confesses that she was against his admission to the academy because he has already suffered a lot. It was Lydia who begged Abby to let Ray live a normal life despite the world's unfair treatment of the commoners. Even though Ray had them as his guardians, she wanted him to meet some friends his age. While Lydia bawls her eyes out outside after confirming that Ray is fine, he also sheds a tear as soon as Abby leaves the room. Subsequently, his friends visit him. He apologizes for keeping keeping his identity as the Iceblade Sorcerer a secret for a long time. He also speaks about using Chrono's lock to suppress the effects of overheating, which makes him unable to use sorcery. During the outburst, Ray reveals that he lost someone he holds dearly, severely injured his master, and claimed countless lives of the kingdom's enemies. As he revisits the painful memory, he starts to question his existence, thinking that he has no right to be by everyone's side. Amelia takes his hand and tells him that she wants him to stay with her, regardless of his past. The rest of the squad joins Amelia and promises Ray that they'll stick together until the end. Night falls, and Albert turns up at the clinic to apologize to Ray. After accepting his apology, Ray knocks some sense into his head and advises him to retrospect to determine his true strength. Back in school, with Helena out of the picture, a new teacher gets introduced, the charming sorcerer, Carol. For her first day, Carol discusses the format of the upcoming tournament where the three academies of sorcery will gather. While the first-year students will participate in the amateur set, the higher years will compete in the main elimination bracket. Since Rebecca won last year's tournament, Arnold Academy earned the advantage of sending six representatives instead of five. All the while, Ray feels uncomfortable watching Carol take over the teacher's role. After class, Ray breaks into the principal's office and begs Abby to dismiss Carol. Claiming that it won't take long until Carol shows her true colors, she appears behind him and caresses his back. As every single strand of his hair rises, Ray moves away from Carol, in a vain attempt to get rid of her. Still treating Ray as a kid, Carol runs after him and demands he hugs her like he used to. Having witnessed her comrade's sorcery skills, Abby tells Ray that Carol isn't going anywhere. Sometime later, Ray and Clarice make their way to the venue of the preliminary competition. When she asks him about his predicted winner in the first matchup, he chooses the female student. As he explains their huge difference in skills, the referee announces the girl's victory, surprising Clarice. Meanwhile, Amelia wins her respective match, but her reaction seems to tell otherwise. The next scene shows the moment before Amelia entered the battle arena. As a member of the Rose family, her father made it clear that she should beat Arian from the Algren family. Back to the present, Ray gathers information about Amelia's potential rival. Rebecca and Dina vouch for Arian's strength as a swordswoman. Rebecca stresses that Arian is extremely proud of being a noble, unlike Amelia. Nonetheless, they have faith that their girl will perform well in the competition. Continuing the preliminaries, it's smooth sailing for Amelia as she's announced as the official representative of Arnold Academy. Ray's small circle can't help but feel proud of their friend for qualifying first. Albert, who finishes second, also secures a spot in the amateur section. The following day after class, he runs into Amelia and confronts her for looking anxious and unhappy despite winning all her matches yesterday. After a long pause, she speaks her mind and says that she can't hold a candle to Arian when it comes to swordsmanship and sorcery. Seeing her acknowledging her defeat, Ray volunteers to train her until the big event. He takes out the book Lydia gave him, revealing that it contains the boot camp he had undergone, which built his solid foundation as a warrior. Hearing this, Amelia accepts his offer. In another flashback, the young and timid Amelia found herself out of place at a grand ball. Fortunately, someone decided to keep her company, it was Arian. From then on, they would frequently meet to wander around and play with each other. They became inseparable as they promised to be best friends forever. It wouldn't last, however. Not only did they grow up, but they also grew further apart when Amelia couldn't accept her defeat against Arian. The latter never changed, and Amelia knew all too well that she ruined their beautiful friendship. Back to the present, Ray startles Amelia as he makes his dramatic entrance at their meeting point with a mask on. Not wasting any time, Master White commands his apprentice to do a 20-kilometer run without enhancing her physical abilities. She tries to complain, only for her master to turn a deaf ear. With that, Amelia obliges his request, and as soon as she finishes, she drops to the ground, gasping for breath. The intensive training continues, and each day, Ray subjects Amelia to a series of grueling endurance tests. One night, while she feels dead tired, she falls asleep quickly and dreams of chasing Arian. Despite calling for her former best friend, she never looks back until she vanishes from sight. 
Funnily enough, Ray rouses Amelia from bed by banging a ladle into a pan. At that instant, she is not entirely sure if she has woken up from a nightmare. Outside the female dormitory, Rebecca and Dina bump into Master White. Annoyed at Ray for causing a disturbance early in the morning, Dina warns him not to trespass on their dorm. Just then, his peripheral vision catches sight of Amelia attempting to escape their morning routine. At the speed of light, Ray runs after her. Days pass, and Amelia skips the training for the second time. While searching for her, he comes across Albert, who looks like a different person because of his haircut. His former number one hater asks him how to be stronger as he still doesn't know if he's going in the right direction. Ray gives Albert a little pep talk, painting a genuine smile on his face. Continuing his search for Amelia in the library, Clarice and Alyssa say they have no idea about her whereabouts. This prompts Ray to use his ability to detect someone's exact location from a distance. He hurriedly runs into Amelia's location and finds her hiding under a table. He grabs her hand and tells her he won't let her go until they arrive at the training ground. To boost Amelia's morale, Ray asks the president of the Environmental Research Club to help him create a cheerleading squad. Having a way with words, Ray successfully convinces their leader. The president also gives him a bag containing an item he requested beforehand. The next day, a mysterious female student wearing the uniform of Diom Academy shows up inside Arnold Academy. Turns out that it's Ray, who cross-dresses to infiltrate their rival school. For what it's worth, he looks way more beautiful than his entitled female noble classmates. Hiding inside a cardboard box, he arrives at the Diom Academy and stumbles upon a crying kid, Tiana Algren, Arian's younger sister. Introducing himself as Lily White, our MC steals the little girl's heart. He takes Tiana's hand and helps her find her sister. As they walk around, his beauty captivates the students, and in a short while, Tiana spots her sister. Sitting face to face with each other, Arian apologizes for the inconvenience her younger sister caused Ray. After introducing themselves, Arian straightforwardly tells Ray that she knows he's not from their academy. Impressed at her mental acuity, Ray is forced to admit that she's right. When he finally drops his feminine voice and reintroduces himself as a man, Arian struggles to gather her wits. That said, she's aware of his identity as the first commoner in Arnold Academy. To return the favor for helping Tiana, Arian rewards Ray by letting him experience her family's battle style. Before their sparring match begins, she begs him to change his voice back to being feminine as she finds it distracting. Arian initiates the battle, and with quick work, Ray's weapon gets destroyed by a single swing of her sword enhanced by lightning. With their mock duel ending in mere seconds, he acknowledges her strength. When Tiana leaves, Ray mentions that he's training Amelia, surprising Arian. There and then, Ray declares that her childhood best friend will defeat her, one way or another. Realizing that Amelia has a reliable friend helping her, Arian says she looks forward to meeting her again inside the arena. On the way back to school, Ray bumps into a girl. As she trips over a piece of rock, he jumps forward and catches her in time. Truth be told, whether Ray is being his usual self or dressing up as a girl, he keeps all the women's hearts fluttering. Just as he's about to leave, the girl requests for his name, and he still poses as Lily. Introducing herself as Maria Bradley, Ray discovers that she's Rebecca's younger sister. At the training ground, Amelia takes a little break from training, with Clarice and Alyssa keeping her company while her master isn't around. Speaking of Ray, his voice startles Amelia as she stands back up and greets him. As soon as they realize that the girl is actually Ray, they completely lose it. The following scene shows Ray and the gang inside a carriage to visit his master. Upon arriving at their destination, they introduce themselves to Lydia. Alyssa, who's a die-hard fan of hers, takes it as an excellent opportunity to get her autograph. Later on, Carla signals Ray to join him in the kitchen. There, she reveals that the Grim Reapers have started to make a move. She alerts him that there's a big chance that the enemies will carry out their plan at the tournament. At the same time, Amelia is spotted talking to Lydia alone. The four-time champion reveals that Ray has been sending her letters regarding Amelia. Although Amelia refuses to share what's bugging her, Lydia tells her to rely on her friends. A few days later, Ray announces the beginning of Amelia's final examination. To earn the badge of recognition, she must slash the rose on his chest. With the game face on, Amelia makes a lunge at Master White. The story shifts to Abby as she welcomes the arrival of the participants for the Sorcery Swordsman Tournament. After delivering a motivational speech, the momentous event officially begins. Walking through the corridors, Amelia gets taken aback when Arian calls her name. Not in the mood to catch up with each other, the former best friends shake each other's hands and promise each other to meet in the finals. Before the viewers know it, the initial matchups are over. To kick off the semi-final rounds, Dina sits as the commentator while Carol becomes the match analyst. Wielding a giant sword, Melcross Academy's Shine Gerard tries to taunt Amelia, who's wearing a deadpan expression. 
When she notices her supporters in the crowd, she finally cracks a smile. Soon enough, the fight begins with Abby as the acting referee. Shine charges first, but Amelia easily dodges his attack. Without the need to exhaust herself in close combat, she burns the rose on his chest with sorcery. Hence, Amelia is proclaimed the winner. For the next matchup, Albert is pitted against another tournament favorite, Arian. Surprisingly, he's holding out against his opponent. But after exchanging a series of aggressive charges, Arian suddenly gets the upper hand, knocking him back. As she suggests Albert concede, he gets back to his knees and dashes toward his opponent. He manages to disarm Arian, but when he's about to deal the final blow, she activates her version of the legendary bare-handed blade block, cutting his weapon in the process. With a solid punch in the gut, Arian secures her win as Albert flies into midair and falls outside the ring. Elsewhere, a grim reaper trails behind Ray. As soon as he detects an ominous presence, he turns around but sees no one, only droplets of acid-like fluids on the floor. He finally calms down when he sees his club president approaching him. Not long after, he leads him to a room where Abby, Lydia, and Carol have gathered. As he expresses his interest in the people guarding the room, Carla tells him they are from the Hale tribe, the unit in charge of the Empire's intelligence. Lydia cuts in, revealing Carla as the best intelligence agent, who also happens to be the sister of the club president, Rex Hale. With Lydia and Carol bickering in the background, Abby informs everyone that the Grim Reapers have invaded the tournament to abduct children from noble families. For this reason, Abby asks Ray to stay on his toes and work with Rex to ensure the student's safety. Back at the competition, Rebecca emerges victorious against her opponent. While Dina announces the next matchup, Alyssa and Clarice tell Ray that Amelia has shut herself in her room. As they talk about how they will address the problem, Dina declares Lucas Forster from Melcross Academy as the winner of the latest fight. The clash only lasted for two seconds, smashing a new tournament record. At night, Ray decides to visit Amelia, although he chooses to speak with her at her doorstep. He reveals that he's scared to step inside her heart, but even so, as her friend, he wants to know how she truly feels. After a brief pause, Amelia lets him inside her room. As a member of the Rose family, she confesses that all her life, she has always lived up to everyone's high expectations. Being a noble and her father's daughter, Amelia admits she has lost her sense of self. Amelia breaks down as she conveys her desperation to win the tournament and achieve something she can be proud of. However, witnessing Arian's battle prowess, she feels certain that she can never win against her. Ray tells her that no matter what happens, he and the rest of the squad will always stay by her side. He also reminds her that it's okay to show her weakness because the real Amelia Rose doesn't always have to be strong. After confiding all her worries to Ray, she holds his hand to sleep. At that moment, Ray recalls Amelia's ardent and burning eyes during her final test in the boot camp. The day of the grand finals for the amateur bracket finally arrives. The heads of the households of both high-ranking noble families grace the event, hoping for their respective daughters to claim the coveted title. Minutes before the main event, Rex notices a light signal. He excuses himself for a moment to attend to a security matter, leaving Dina throwing a fit. Just as Amelia makes her way to the arena, Rex, while flexing, informs Ray that Clarice and eight noble students have disappeared. As the people tasked to protect the students, they immediately search for the missing nobles. While they are at it, the final match has already started. Arian throws her sword as she goes all out from the get-go with her sorcery, boosting her physical abilities. She thwacks the falling blade at Amelia, but she deflects it. Using the same technique which defeated Albert, Arian draws the first blood. She launches another attack which almost throws Amelia out of the ring. With her eyes glowing, Amelia summons a pink force field, knocking her opponent back. Switching to Ray's mission, he finds Clarice and the other students. However, their ordeal is far from over as Ray realizes that the Grim Reapers have trapped them in a dimensional prison, a space that is shut off from the outside world. Ray quickly carries Clarice over his shoulder and runs off to buy himself some time. After releasing the Chrono's lock, he summons the Icicle Blades and hurls them at the enemies. Suddenly, the whole area gets engulfed in darkness, prompting Ray to use his ice crystals to illuminate the space. During this interval, Arian receives a great deal of damage from the explosive butterflies. That is until all the magic gets nullified, confusing the participants and the spectators. Carol knows that Ray activated the anti-material field, although he went too far. The Grim Reapers try to escape, but Ray immobilizes them by freezing their bodies. Rex turns up and tells him that he'll take over the situation. And so, Ray and Clarice rush outside to watch the match. Once the nullifying magic gets lifted, Arian showcases her ultimate move, channeling her inner Super Saiyan. 
With that, she turns the tide of battle in her favor and lands a solid blow on her opponent. Struggling to stand back up, Amelia slowly accepts her defeat, until she hears Rey cheering for her. And that is all Amelia needs, a driving force from Rey that enables her to unlock a magic container, granting her a huge boost in power. As the seesaw battle continues, Arian charges in full power, only for her attacks to get directed elsewhere. Using original sorcery, the butterfly effect, Amelia stresses that Arian won't be able to touch her. Despite it being futile, she keeps throwing punches. Things take an unexpected turn when Amelia coughs blood, worrying Rey as she exhibits a sign of overheating. Unable to keep up with her ultimate technique, she is forced to fight Arian in close combat. Shortly, they put all their faith into their respective finishing moves until the scene fades into white. Upon waking up, Arian is greeted by Amelia with a worried expression. The former tells the latter she has become stronger, making her tear up. Apart from winning, reconciling with her best friend is the best reward she receives in the tournament, sending the crowd roaring in loud cheers. Despite Arian's loss, her family is seemingly content after witnessing her resolve. Meanwhile, Amelia's father claps for his daughter's victory. Later on, at the infirmary, Ray checks on the heavily bandaged Amelia, who looks back at her struggles during training. Apparently, he has no idea about her immense power, but he knows she has a huge potential to be an excellent sorcerer. Amelia expresses her gratitude to Rey for not giving up on her. Moving on to the main event, Rey and the gang walk together to the amphitheater to support Rebecca. Once there, Rey notices that Maria is watching by the stairs while their father sits comfortably in one of the VIP boxes. Before the battle starts, the defending champion pleads with the competition's dark horse to go easy on her. That said, Rebecca prepares to unleash her sorcery, but Lucas has no intention of letting her activate any spells. With a single step, a blinding light envelops the arena until darkness takes over. Before she knows it, Lucas has destroyed the rose on her armor. And just like that, Rebecca gets dethroned, leaving the crowd gasping in amazement at Lucas' flawless victory. While Rebecca shudders at her dismal performance, the new champion casually steps outside the arena. On his way out, he bumps into Rey. It appears that Lucas knows that Rey is the Iceblade Sorcerer as they are both successors of Grand Sorcerers. Turns out that Lucas is the modern generation's Deathblade Sorcerer. When Rey asks him why he competed in a tournament for students, Lucas claims that he wants our MC to witness the power of a Deathblade Sorcerer. To prove he's the strongest among the seven, he challenges Rey to a duel. But then, it won't happen anytime soon because Lucas wants Rey's overheating to get treated first so he can fight him at full power. After the conclusion of the final battle, Abby, Lydia, and Carol head on straight to the Grim Reapers that are held captive. As the charming sorcerer, Carol showcases her unique ability, making the enemies obey her commands. After fooling around, she asks them about their future plans and who their boss is. To her disappointment, the Grim Reapers seemingly self-destruct, leaving them empty-handed. As the tournament ends, the students gather in the arena for the closing ceremony. While Abby delivers another speech, Rebecca scans the crowd and sees her father talking to someone. A few days later, the class gets into a heated argument when Ray suggests a maid cafe as their booth for the upcoming school festival. Well, it's actually Amelia's idea, but she lets Ray do the talking. Initially, the nobles can't picture themselves wearing a servant's outfit until Carol shows them how it's done. After the tumultuous meeting, Ray and Amelia get shocked to the core when Dina informs them that Rebecca is engaged. Elsewhere, Rebecca's father signs a contract with Evan Bernstein, the man he was with during the tournament. As part of the deal, he will surrender Rebecca to Evan. In the middle of the streets, a man named Glutton sucks the engram of an assassin from an opposing faction. Just as he fills himself up, a cloaked figure with a mask steps in and takes the poor guy's brain. Eerily enough, the corpse stands back up. It is then revealed that they are looking for a vessel for their organization to reach new heights in sorcery. To make it short, they're searching for Rebecca, who's crying blood at that point. The next morning, Ray approaches Rebecca and congratulates her on her engagement. She clarifies that even though she's already engaged, she will stay in the academy until she graduates. Hearing this, Ray feels relieved that she won't resort to an untimely exit. When they shake each other's hands, Ray detects something. On a lighter note, the male students start to prepare the booth, and we all know why they are so pumped up. To motivate them even more, Ray announces that Alyssa just agreed to wear a maid outfit, leaving them roaring. In the afternoon, Ray shows up at the student council's office to submit the documents regarding the maid cafe. When he notices there are many empty seats, Dina reveals that the other officers won't be coming anymore. Rebecca takes it upon herself to explain the pressing matter. According to Rebecca, Cornea, the club's secretary, was supposed to get married to Evan until she entered the picture and snatched her fiancé. With the majority of officers standing by Cornea's side, they joined her and abandoned their positions in the student council. As expected of RMC, he volunteers to lend them a hand. 
Just as Ray leaves the room, Dina follows him and informs him that the rushed engagement doesn't sit right with her. She believes that Rebecca's fiancé might be plotting something against her friend. While having a late night shower, Rebecca, who's still crying blood, ponders why she keeps seeing Ray's past in her dreams. When she steps outside the shower room, someone turns the lights on. With a suspicious look on her face, Maria asks about the blood on the washcloth. Rebecca claims that she's having nosebleeds lately. When she's asked about how she's holding up with her engagement, she tells Maria that she's fine. However, once Rebecca is back in her room, she drops the facade and bursts into tears. As the school festival draws near, the girls get on a clothing fitting. Ray enters the room, and his tongue automatically tells the girls how beautiful they look. Clarice arrives with a ghost outfit, but despite her creepy costume, Ray says she's cute. Night falls, and Ray waits for Rebecca to finish all the paperwork. He offers to take her home since she's no longer staying in the dorm after her engagement. A few blocks away from her fiancé's house, Evan turns up. After introducing themselves to each other, the husband-to-be takes it from there. While Ray feels uneasy, Rex appears behind him. He leads him to Abby and the others discussing Evan's ulterior motive. After looking into the matter, they suspect that Evan is living someone's identity, and that he is after Rebecca's sorcery eyes. In exchange for replacing the Rose family as the highest in the top three noble families, Rebecca's father agreed to let Evan marry his daughter, unaware that the man is a sorcery eye collector. Strangely enough, she continues to get a glimpse of Ray's past in her dreams. At school, Maria meets with Ray. Although she's insecure about Rebecca being the perfect daughter, Maria admits she can't just turn a blind eye to her elder sister's suffering. Ray assures Maria that he will protect her sister. Unbeknownst to them, Rebecca is watching in the background. Sometime later, she can hardly fall asleep as her mind keeps rewinding Ray and Maria hugging each other. One night, Ray and Rebecca meet in their dreams. She asks about who he is, and just as he's about to reveal his identity, he wakes up. After that, one of his eyes also bleeds. The following morning, neither of them talks about last night. Rebecca is dying to know the truth, but she stops herself from asking Ray about it. Soon afterward, the day for the school festival finally arrives. While the Algren sisters want to see Amelia, Maria hopes to chance upon Lily. Speaking of which, Lily returns, drawing everyone's attention. As such, one of the guys claims that the door to the new world has opened for him. While Arian is as gobsmacked as ever, Tiana feels delighted to see Lily. Switching to his number one simp, Maria struggles to pull herself together around him. Unfortunately, Lily's cameo ends for now as he returns to being a Chad, accompanying Rebecca to at least help her forget her problems just for a day. Outside the school grounds, Maria comes across a strange woman. To her horror, the woman warns her that her sister will die. At the same instant, Ray learns about it from Lydia, who tells him that he can prevent it from happening. Just then, Rebecca's father steps in and begs Ray to save his daughter. On the second day of the festival, while everyone is busy, Evan starts to make his move and abducts Rebecca. As soon as she regains consciousness, Evan begins her reawakening. Using his ability, Ray manages to locate Rebecca's whereabouts. There, multiple monsters welcome his sight. Although they are weak creatures, Ray worries that his inside code might not last with their numbers. That is until his squad arrives at the scene to remind him of his own advice that they should rely on each other. With their teamwork, they eliminate several monsters at once. As Glutton heads to the top of the mountain, Ray's friends assure him they can handle themselves. And so, Ray rushes to save Rebecca. In another flashback, Rebecca's father revealed that the Bradley family was cursed. Once every few generations, someone in their bloodline would suffer from the evil power of Crutes. Since Rebecca couldn't fully control her sorcery eyes, she wouldn't be able to live past the age of 20. From one revelation to another, the cloaked figure who works with Glutton reveals himself as the real Evan, while the Evan who kidnapped Rebecca and is engaged to her turns out to be the mysterious woman, Lyslot Eden, the fabrication sorceress. Claiming that she controlled him and stole his life, Evan vows to send her to the afterlife. With Rebecca as the Crutes' host, Evan attempts to wrap her in flames until Lyslot interferes to stop him. Using her ability, she sends Evan to another dimension. Lyslot then tells Maria she should leave everything to Ray, signaling his grand entrance at the scene. Craving for the Ice Blade Sorcerer's engram, Glutton charges at him, only to crash into a barrier summoned by Lyslot. She tells Ray about her objective, which is to make Rebecca go through overheating and have him help her seal it. She reveals that Ray is the only one who can save Rebecca because they're connected. Lyslot admits that it's her true contract with Rebecca's father, and whatever means Ray chooses to use, as long as she lives, it doesn't matter. Minutes later, Glutton breaks the barrier, prompting Ray to activate his power. As they clash, Lyslot reunites with Evan in a separate dimension. Using the same taboo technique Helena used during the fight with Ray, Evan turns himself into a bloodthirsty monster. He lunges at Lyslot, but he fails to penetrate her defense. With a single spell, Evan returns to his human form with mortal wounds. Before he succumbs to his death, he asks Lyslot if she's the strongest among the seven, 
to which she says no, revealing that the Ice Blade Sorcerer is the most powerful among them. Back to Ray's friends, they let out a sigh of relief after eliminating all the monsters, or so they thought. More gigantic monsters appear and attack them. Fortunately, the veteran sorcerers arrive in perfect timing as the students have used up most of their mana. Carla, Abby, Carol, and Lydia treat the students for a spectacle as they display their opus abilities and annihilate all the monsters. On the other hand, Glutton unleashes his full power as he transforms into Ogre Rakshasa. With his brute strength, Ray becomes the enemy's punching bag. Just as Glutton is about to devour Ray, he reveals his trump card, freezing his opponent to death inside the red ice. As Ray falls to the ground, Maria stops Rebecca from helping him. Maria blames her sister for making everyone around her suffer. She even slaps Rebecca in a desperate attempt to spark negative emotions from her. As soon as Rebecca overheats, Ray uses Chrono's lock to prevent it from consuming her, hence saving her life. After the incident, the love rivals, Rebecca and Amelia, agree to compete for Ray's affection. Alyssa and Claris intervene, but before they can pester them with questions about their deal, Ray comes into view. Just then, the night sky glows with fireworks. The following day, Ray visits Havard's grave and introduces all his friends to him. As the first season draws to a close, a little girl is seen patiently waiting for her brother to return. 